today we are going to talk about delivery delivery is important in public speaking because if you are boring people will not want to listen to you as you can see this is dr. Heidi I'm in my basement studio and I am covering chapter 13 delivery of Dr. Lucas's The Art of Public Speaking 13th edition. Whoa, wait, if people actually gave speeches like that, I would be so bored. I bet you would be bored too. Am I right? Yeah. I think so. Okay, so take two. 13 is my lucky number. I love 13. Chapter 13 is what we're covering today in the 13th edition of Dr. Lucas's textbook, The Art of Public Speaking. It is awesome because I love teaching public speaking. I love teaching anything and everything about public speaking because, well, ha, I love public speaking. It's awesome. Let's get excited about learning about delivery. There are many things that go into delivery, many of which are nonverbal communication. See, take two is much better. Okay, so what is nonverbal communication? Nonverbal communication is based on use of voice and body and it does not have to do with the words you're actually saying. Ooh. Did we jump a few here to methods of delivery? No, we did not. All right. Well, let's see. We may have to come back to types of nonverbal communication, but let's keep checking this out here. Okay, so there are four methods of delivery. There is the manuscripted style, the memory, the impromptu, and this big word down here, extemporaneous, which is what you will do most often in public speaking classes, and I find this the easiest method by which to give speeches, extemporaneous. But let's take a look at the different types. So first is manuscript. Manuscripted speaking is written out fully and read to the audience. Who uses manuscripted speaking? Well, usually people that use manuscripted speaking are like presidential candidates, other people who have teleprompters, and their life is much easier because they've written out the speech in its entirety, and then you can just read it. Read it from a teleprompter. Now, if you remember way back to the 2008 election, there was this lady named Sarah Palin who was running for office. And Sarah Palin's teleprompter quit and malfunctioned during her acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention. <sighs> so she had to ad lib and things just didn't go very well for her because the manuscript on the teleprompter was going so quickly she couldn't read it and it turned into a much worse speech than she probably would have given had she given an extemporaneous speech practicing on her own. What she ended up giving was probably an impromptu speech. An impromptu speech is with little or no immediate preparation. Okay, so first, first things first. If you are doing an impromptu speech, an impromptu speech, you can at least prepare a little bit if you have time, say, from the back of the room to the front of the room, or if you are receiving an award, or if you are giving an award, don't make it a last minute off the cuff speech. You can think of at least three main points that you wanna get across to the audience before you get up to the front of the room to give that presentation or accept that award. If you've been nominated for an award, just assume that you're gonna get it. Does it mean you're necessarily gonna get it? No, but there is the power of positive thinking and you'll have time to think of the three people you wanna thank and then it won't seem like such an impromptu sort of speech. If you remember our last slide was the manuscripted speech. Now, if you 
decide that you're going to write your speech out in its entirety, which I have done a couple of times when I have spoken in churches and at, well, at Christian weddings, Muslim funerals. I've done that quite often. And I wrote out a eulogy or I've read passages in their entirety. So in order to do that really effectively, there's a couple of tricks you can do. You can print the type in a little bit bigger font so it's easier to read. You can highlight every other line so it's easier to follow along. And you can also do like they do in speed reading and follow along with your finger. Might be something also that you did in elementary school, following along with your finger. But that will make it easier to stay on track for giving a manuscripted speech. Again, I think this one is pretty difficult and so is impromptu speaking. The other one, whew, manuscripted, impromptu, huh, I think they forgot an extra slide here on memorized speaking. Okay, so if you're going to give a memorized speech, this is speaking from memory. I have done this before. When I was younger, the first speeches that I gave were memorized speeches. I had lots of time to practice, lots of time to memorize, lots of time to prepare, and I still had note cards just in case I forgot. Memorized speaking is really hard because you have to try to remember what you planned to say in the exact order or you will forget. It's just that simple. The one that is the easiest is the extemporaneous style. You have carefully prepared and rehearsed and you present it from brief notes. For my classes, this is done on note cards. It takes a little bit less preparation time than a memorized speech or a manuscripted speech even. And you can deliver it in a more conversational style. So conversational quality is what we're going for. We want to sound spontaneous no matter how often we've rehearsed. So we want the people to think that we are having a conversation with them rather than giving them a speech, being a fantastic order. Rather, it's a two-way street where the speaker gives information and the listener provides feedback. Okay, so we're back now to the nonverbal communication that I wasn't sure if we were gonna make it back to. But the use of the speaker's voice. You saw some of these when, we, when I first started out. I tried to be fairly monotonous, which is going to be, or monotone, right? Which is going to be the pitch. Volume, you have to have a good volume for your speech, otherwise people might not be able to hear you or you might be too loud and they'll be tired of listening to you. The rate at which you speak can be really quick or it can be really slow. If it's too fast, it's hard for people to keep up and to pay attention to what you want to say or what you are saying, and it's really hard for them to process all of the information you're putting forward. Pauses are good. You don't wanna use verbal garbage. Verbal garbage is when you say, um, uh, and you know, these are also known as vocalized pauses. Let's take a look at what Dr. Lucas's PowerPoint has to say next. By the way, the PowerPoint that I have been using is from Dr. Lucas's textbook and not exactly how I would create it, but I find it helpful if it's going to go along with what you're studying. So let's take a look or softness of my voice. If I talk too quietly, you all are going to think there's something wrong with your computer or your phone where you are trying to listen to this video. That's why I need to talk in, a, in, a, in an appropriate volume so that you can hear me. Pitch is the highness or the lowness of your voice. Rate is the speed at which a person speaks. I am an auctioneer, so I can talk super, super fast. If you are ready, I will do a tongue twister for you that I studied in auctioneering school. 
Ready to write this down? I bet you can't. Okay, let's go. Betty bought her butt some butter, but she said it's butter and bitter. If I put it in my batter, make them a better bitter solution. But a bit of butter, butter, put it in a bit of butter, made a bit of butter, butter, so it's butter. Betty bought her butter, bit of butter, butter. Whew. That was super fast. I actually used to be even faster, but I haven't sold things at auction for a couple of years. So I'm not quite as fast as I used to be. But you can still hear my change of volume and pitch and rate in there, which is kind of like the auctioneer's chant. Why do auctioneers sell stuff so quickly, you might ask? Well, they sell things quickly for a couple of reasons. First, if I said, will anybody bid $1? I will take $1. People are gonna be bored. There will be no impulse buying. And it will take me all day to sell items at auction. That's why we go rather quickly. The other thing you want to take, keep into consideration, like I said, are pauses. These are momentary breaks in vocal delivery. Really, if you just pause, it is much better than actually vocalizing them. Vocalized pauses include these things like, uh, er, um, so, well, and, you know. People get tired of hearing these things. I had a friend who sold Fords, he was a Ford dealer, and he did a spot on the local radio station every week to sell cars. He would say, um and ah, so often that he only got about 15 seconds out of the 30 seconds that he was paying for. I said that if he could eliminate some of these, he could probably sell twice as many cars. So we practiced, and his advertisements got a lot better. In fact, he did sell more cars. Vocal variety is the changes in rate, pitch, and volume. This gives your voice expressiveness. This is how I know as a public speaking instructor that you're actually interested in the topic, that you're passionate about it, that you care about it, and that you wanna convey a good message to your listeners. Pronunciation is the accepted standard of sound rhythm, sound and rhythm, in a given language. So let's think about this. People all over the country pronounce things differently. How are you going to know how you're supposed to pronounce a word? Well, listen to the people around you. Listen to how they pronounce the word. Is the city of, is the capital of South Dakota Pierre or is it Pierre? If you ask the people in South Dakota, it's Pierre. The town in Virginia and the town in Nebraska is spelled N-O-R-F-O-L-K, but neither of them say Norfolk. One says Norfolk, that's Virginia, and one says Norfolk, that's Nebraska. Make sure that you ask. And then I went to North Dakota State University, and at North Dakota State University, our mascot is the bison. Yes, I know, most other people say bison, but not up north in North Dakota. They say bison. So when game day, you know, you've seen game day on ESPN, when they came to Fargo, they needed to learn how to say bison. Because the first time they said it, they said, let's go bison. And nobody responded. Make sure that you're pronouncing things as appropriately and accurately to locality as possible. We also have the concept of articulation. I also refer to this one as enunciation. And this is the physical production of speech sounds. If I say that you are speaking too quickly or you are speaking with your mouth half closed, it's probably a good idea to slow down and open your mouth wider. This will help with your enunciation or articulation. Dialect is the variety of language distinguished by accent, grammar, and vocabulary. If you've ever noticed, people in the southeastern United States speak differently than people in the northeastern United States compared to the Midwest, compared to the Southwest, people in all parts of the United States have a different dialect. Can you imagine if we added people all over the world? They have a different dialect as well. I grew up near Canada, and in Canada, they say things like, eh? We don't say, eh, in any of the states that I know of, but 
This is the dialect that we need to pay attention to should we find ourselves speaking in Canada someday. The speaker's body is also important. You need to pay attention to your personal appearance, your movement, your gestures, and your eye contact. Why? Why do people care? Well, because they do. We're judgmental. That's the way we roll. We're even judgmental about ourselves, right? So, personal appearance. You want to do things to enhance your personal appearance, like dress up a little bit better, maybe one step above the way you would normally dress if you're giving a presentation. If you're giving a professional presentation, colors like black and navy blue are completely acceptable and even encouraged because they distract less from your message. You should also take a shower, brush your teeth. If you're a lady, you might want to wear makeup. Men, remove some of your jewelry. Ladies, don't wear too much because it gets gaudy. All of these things should be taken into consideration. Eye contact. Why do we make eye contact? Now you know. Well, we make eye contact so that people feel involved in our presentations. Find three people in the room, a nice looking person over here who smiles and encourages you, someone in the middle, same issue, and then someone over here. Nice, smiling, encourages you. Maybe they might be nodding and providing positive feedback. Those are the people you wanna focus on. There are two things I wanna remind you of. First thing, do not picture the audience in their underwear and do not picture the audience naked. Why? I know you've heard this about public speaking numerous times, but I can guarantee there are people in your audience that you do not wanna see naked or in their underwear. So instead of doing that, find those friendly faces in the audience. Then hopefully you won't be laughing hysterically at your audience members. This is another fun word, kinesics. Kinesics is the study of body motions as modes of communication. Kinesics actually is the study of body motion. So if I want you to follow me and I want to give a good presentation, I can come over here at, at times to show you what I'm talking about. It's also easier for you to follow along if I gesture to the words behind me. Moving around makes people feel involved and makes people feel like they are part of the message, part of the presentation, and that they are an important part of the message and the presentation. People who are beginning speakers often have difficulty with this. So be careful. Don't pace, don't do a box step dance and constantly move, right? Try not to rock back and forth or this way, right? Those will just indicate your nervousness. If you're nervous, move around. It'll make you feel better, I promise. If you're going to do delivery, hmm, if you're gonna give a speech, you might wanna practice. Go through the preparation outline out loud. Prepare a speaking outline on note cards. Practice your speech out loud, again. <laughs> Polish and, and refine your delivery and do a dress rehearsal. These are all important things that will allow you to feel like you are most prepared for the speech you are about to give. Sometimes there's a question and answer session. In my public speaking classes, not so much. But every once in a while, you will find these, particularly if you are giving a professional speech. So you want to formulate answers to possible questions, come up with a list of questions that you think people might have, and then answer them. Practice the delivery of the answers. You can also have a friend or family member help you out with deciding what kind of questions the audience might ask. In a question and answer session, you want to make sure that you manage things carefully. You want to approach a question and answer session with a positive attitude. You want to listen carefully to the question that's asked so you're not answering the wrong question. You want to direct answers to the entire audience, although I look most often at the person who has asked the question. And then be honest and straightforward and stay on track. If you're being honest and straightforward, sometimes you might not know the answer. That's okay. Tell them you don't know the answer and that you'll look it up and get back to them. 
The worst thing you can do is pretend you know what you're talking about. Chapter 13, yes, it was lucky, it went well, everything is good, yay! <laughs>